Welcome to the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Now, here's your host, editor Christian Berg. All right, welcome back to the Bow Hunting Podcast. We are thrilled that you've taken some time to be with us today. And you know, it might be spring and it might be turkey season. And we love turkey hunting. But you know, we're always looking forward to the fall and whitetail season. And I've got a great show lined up for you today because we're going to talk some DIY whitetail opportunities. And I thought it would be a great time because this is a time of year everybody's finding out about their draw results. And if you haven't gotten all those tags you were hoping to have, you might be looking to fill your schedule in with some other opportunities. And there are some great deer hunting resources available for anybody who wants to take the time and effort to do it. So to explore that a little bit deeper today, I want to introduce my guest. First, I've got Mr. Will Brantley, a noted outdoor writer, a field and stream contributor, an editor for many, many years, and he hails from the great Commonwealth, not state, but Commonwealth of Kentucky. Will, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Christian. That was, that was quite an introduction there. <laughs> well, I've hunted down with Will a couple times and, you know, my lackluster results notwithstanding, he's got a tremendous whitetail resource down there in uh, southwestern Kentucky. And uh, Lord willing, uh, I get another opportunity one of these days and finally get that bugaboo off my back. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, you've been snake bitten for sure. So, but, uh, but no, we, we, we've got some pretty good hunting around here and, and in some of the other states here in the southeast. I'm looking forward to digging in and talking about it a little bit. Yeah, and I can see all those racks in the background. So just a few. Oh, yeah, for sure. All <laughs> DIY public land stick bow kills, for sure. Except for that one that I shot over a, shot over a feeder in Texas with a rifle. <laughs> well, hey, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And then, so you heard uh, another laugh there. That is uh, Mr. Jace Bowserman, a uh, frequent contributor to Peterson's Bow Hunting, a really great member of our editorial team and, and a great guy, a good friend of mine. Um, and he hails from the great state of Colorado, where you're better known for elk and mule deer and, and maybe some other species. But don't sleep on those Colorado whitetails. Yeah, absolutely, Christian, man. Thanks so much for having me on. I look forward to talking to you guys. And, you know, the thing about Colorado is, and a lot of your Western states, is, is whitetails do get overlooked because of the elk and mule deer. Um, but uh, I got bit by the whitetail bug here, oh, probably seven, eight years ago. And a lot of people think I'm crazy here because in Colorado for mule deer and, and whitetail, minus special instances, it's still an, you still have to apply for a, a deer tag. Most all deer tags are by draw, but mule deer are uh, a lot harder to come by and whitetail you can get on second and third choice options. There's a lot of times there's leftovers. So we can talk about a lot of that stuff too, but uh, yeah, I love chasing those things around. It's going to be, it's going to be fun to talk about. Yeah. So I was thinking between myself, obviously I'm here in Pennsylvania. You got, you got Will down in the Southeast, you got Jace out West and hopefully, you know, with the three of us, we can highlight some opportunities pretty much no matter where you are in the country. And then across, if you, if you drew a triangle, right, with where the three of us are and you look in the middle of that, well, that's the area that sort of everybody knows about. And why don't we start there? Because you know, as I was saying before we started the show, my idea with this is, you know, this is a time of the year. Like I, I told you guys, I had just submitted my Kansas whitetail application. Um, other people are going to be putting in for Iowa. That's probably the best known state where you have to draw. And it actually takes five or six years to get a non-resident archery tag in Iowa. Um, of course, Illinois has a draw. Although the little dirty little secret there is they haven't sold out of tags for a number of years. But with the way things are going in Iowa, in Kansas, where they're seeing unprecedented demand, I wouldn't be surprised if people start to spill back over to Illinois. Maybe maybe that gets back to a situation where they exhaust their allocation. And so the bottom line is in some of these better known whitetail states, especially in the Midwest, it's getting harder to draw a tag. You know, I really think Kansas, unfortunately, is on its way to becoming an every other year state. And hopefully it doesn't get worse than that. But and, and before we jump into these other states, just, you know, help me out, guys. I can't really think of anywhere else other than Kansas and Iowa where you really have 
maybe not a guaranteed chance to get a whitetail tag every year. Are there other states that you guys know of where, you, where it's hard to draw a whitetail tag? Because I, because I, because I can think of other states like Montana where you have to draw, but I've sure. never not, I've never not drawn anywhere else where it's like tough. So far as whitetails go, I mean, I, um, it, particularly in the Midwest, like I, I can't really think of that. I mean, I think everything in Nebraska is, or, or at least in, in most of Nebraska is over the counter. There may be some, some draw stuff in Western Nebraska and I'm pretty sure there are for, for mule deer, but I can't think of anything on the whitetail front. You know, there's some, there are some hunts. I mean, if you, if you move down to the South, um, you know, like in Texas, for example, um, you know, everybody thinks of Texas as being, you know, exclusively a private land deal, but there's actually some really good kind of draw hunt opportunities in Texas. And like the, the tag, like the whitetail permit is over the counter, but you technically have to apply for the hunt, you know, and there's, and there's several of those. So like, you know, and there's even some that I think of in, in some of the other Southern states, like I'll talk about here in a little while that, um, you know, you, you still have to draw your spot for that particular hunt. So it, it is in essence a draw hunt, but the, but the permits technically yeah. over the counter. If you weren't yes. able to get it, you could go, you know, hunt elsewhere. Sure. So the, you know, so the, the point is for the most part, you know, with the couple exceptions, whitetail opportunity is pretty wide open and you were going to say something, Jason. Yeah. Well, like even, even in South Dakota, you know, that's, you see say that's, that's changed a little bit too. Um, you know, it's not like a tag you're going to have to wait uh, years and years for. You can get it every year, but now to hunt public land in South Dakota, you have to you have to actually you know get that application put in, and they send you a tag, and you have to do it by a certain certain date and time. So you know, showing up in South Dakota and going to the Pierre office or wherever one of those offices and just buying a tag. So you really need to stay up to date because things are continually changing. And like even here in Colorado, um, you know, every year we do a five season. Uh, a five-year structure and this year some things changed and some whitetail units got affected they got lumped in with some other units um that are now going to make those tags a little harder to come by because they're not individual isolated units anymore that nobody put in for now they've lumped them in with some some bigger you know five six seven eight nine units when you pull that tag so it's just important to stay up on that. it's not hard to get a tag but you got to stay uh up to date on the ever-changing you know it's very fluid so yeah, you Western guys always like to make it complicated. And, you know, that's not so those aren't necessarily the opportunities that I really want to focus on today, because what I want to do is I want to throw out, you know, some options where it's like, hey, you haven't planned. You know, you you rolled out of bed the first of August or the first of September and you're like, hey, uh, I think I want to take a week off this fall and, and, and go to another state and do some deer hunting. So, I mean, I'll kick it off. Uh, it's an easy, easy decision. If you're in the Northeast, if you're anywhere, you know, honest to goodness, from Maine all the way down to like Virginia, and you're like, I, I don't want to take a trip. Guys, if you've never hunted Ohio, just go to Ohio. Forget everything else. I mean, I'm not saying there's not other great options and we can talk about them. You know, I mean, heck, if you live in New England, even Pennsylvania, you know, which I would hardly ever recommend to somebody. Honestly, our deer numbers are pretty good. There's opportunities here, and I can talk about that a little later. But if you're looking for trophy quality, plenty of publicly accessible land, and a guaranteed license that's cheap, if you look at what the cost of licenses are around the country, for like less than $200, you can go as a non-resident in Ohio, show up at any point during the season, stop at Walmart or a local sporting goods store, get your license and be in the woods the same day and have a legitimate chance of like 120 or better buck um, and, and, and probably not run into a whole ton of of other hunters. I mean, you might you're going to see some guys out there, but it's it's nothing compared to what a lot of us are used to if you live in the more heavily populated areas here along the east coast like i'm from so so i would start out as saying you know if you're looking for an area in the northeastern you know quarter of the country ohio absolutely can't beat it it's one of the top all time you know boone and crockett pope and young states it, it's a it's a big buck mecca and honestly it's somewhat mind-blowing to me guys 
when you look at how game management has gone nationwide with quotas and draws and limited entry, that Ohio is as good as it is. And you can still just go there every year and everybody and their mother can can chase bucks. So that's mine. So who wants to go next? Well, I'm, I'm, I'll go next because mine, mine's going to be pretty easy too. Um, you know, Christian, you just don't want people coming to Pennsylvania. That's why you said, you know, you'll, you'll just uh, not direct you know, your home state. Uh, I'm going to a lot of one eighties here, man. A <laughs> lot of one eighties guaranteed. Um, you know, for me right here, being where I'm at in the West, I mean, I, I guess you may lump this in as a Midwest spot, but you can't beat Nebraska. I mean, you just can't, um, you can buy an over the counter tag there. You know, the state is so good about their website is super informative. You jump on there. There's a public land hunt atlas and they have it all. They have walk in They're They're continually adding walk in constantly. Uh, there's lots of um, I mean, there's there's grasslands. There's 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 really a, a lot of varied terrain from western Nebraska all the way across uh, all, all the way across the state. You have a lot of reservoirs and things like that. Um, that allow hunting with river systems and things like that running into them. But then like in Nebraska, certain parts of Western Nebraska, um, you get into the grasslands and things like that. You get up into the Northern part of the state up around Shadron and things like that. Um, you know, you're hunting pine forests and things that would be, that would be uh, more, more Western oriented, I guess. Um, and the population of whitetails in that state is, is pretty remarkable. So uh, the tags are, you know, when you when compared to even a Colorado whitetail tag or uh, Kansas whitetail tag, those, you know, you, it's hard to beat the price of those tags. It's it's hard to beat the access. Um, and you know, every year we see lots of really good bucks come out of Nebraska off public land. Um, so it's no, it's by no means a, a sleeper type state, but uh, it is a state where you have whitetails throughout and lots and lots of public access. Well, and one thing about Nebraska, you know, for people like from my part of the world who are, you know, used to just having a lot more people around, Nebraska is, you get outside the towns in Nebraska, it is not a heavily populated state. And no. I, gar I guarantee you, Jace, you know, and I'm sure you know of some particular pieces of public ground where you've hunted over the years. You can literally show up the last week of October, first week or two of November yep. on like a Tuesday morning, a Thursday morning, and be the only person yeah. parked at a given walk-in area. And that just blows your mind when you're from Pennsylvania because there's not a game lands anywhere near my house that I'm not saying I'm going to be covered up in people, but there's going to be other trucks in the lot, you know? Yeah, no question. And, and that's what I found. It, it, you know, the last two weeks of October, especially, um, that's really when I like to hit uh, hit areas in Nebraska is those last couple of weeks of October. And it reminds me a lot of parking lots um, in Colorado during that first week of September for, for elk, you know, mule deer spots are going to be getting hit guys looking for those velvet rack muleys up in the high country. But you know, a lot of your, your, your elk pressure doesn't really hit until that middle portion of September, because guys want that, you know, traditional where bulls are really, really, really screaming and going crazy. And, you know, when we used to open in August, we don't anymore, but I mean, you know, trailheads were vacant, but uh, yeah, it's a great state for sure. Sorry, guys. One more thing before I kick it over to Will. That's different, say, in that part of the country than what Will and I are normally dealing with is your terrain is so much different there in Nebraska than it is back east. Typically in Nebraska, like you talked about, now not the whole state, you, you talked about some northern areas where there's big yeah. pine forests and stuff, but generally, you know, you get a lot of prairie, broken country, a lot of open ground, and you tend to focus on the creek and river bottoms. And if you can find the cover of the trees, those are gonna be really likely areas to set up and ambush deer. Whereas, you know, some of the areas that Will's gonna talk about in a minute, you're gonna to have to get in there and do a little bit more scouting to figure out where you're gonna find the deer. Sure, yeah, and those those creek and river draws and things like that are really, really great. But one of the things I think it really gets overlooked a lot, especially if you're hunting in November and the rut's really going is, you know, you, you get those CRP fields and you get areas of really rolling grasslands. You just get a few cedar breaks and things like that out there, plum thickets, those sorts of things. You'd be surprised if you put, put time into watching those areas with good glass, with a spotter, with a pair of 15s, much like you would 
um, out, you know, in, in Colorado hunting elk and mule deer, putting, putting that glass to work and finding those deer in areas where they're just pushing does around out in this very open area. And you can, there's certain situations, things you can use, tactics you can use to take advantage and get out there and get a good bow buck on the ground without ever getting in a tree stand or a ground blind. Yeah. Good, good tips. And, uh, you know, lots of opportunity out there uh, that are, again, it's overlooked places where you're, you're probably not going to see 10 other guys, you know, trying to glass that same area. So let's kick it over to Will. And I'm just going to Oh, put my my finger to the wind here. And I'm going to guess he doesn't recommend Kentucky because he's tired of all these Yankees coming down there. He's probably going to tell us Indiana or or Tennessee is a place to be down there in his neck of the world. Oh, I, I love your Ohio recommendation. Like anybody that's coming to coming to hunt Kentucky, I'm like, no, Ohio is a really good spot. So, but uh, <laughs> no, seriously, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk Kentucky, um, I, I don't I don't mind talking it up a bit. Um, but if we're gonna if, you know, everybody kind of focuses on the on the western region of Kentucky where I am, um, kind of kind of east to about Lexington to about the bluegrass region. That's where you're going to get the rolling hills, the crop fields, things like that. Um, can be really good, particularly if you can get on some private ground, go with an outfitter, et cetera. The, the kind of the downside of this end of the state, there is some public ground, but it's um, it tends to be kind of big woods, heavy forested stuff. And it, you know, it can be, you know, during the rut. Yeah, you can you can for sure get on some deer if you want to come to Kentucky in September and do that velvet hunt like a lot of people want to. This is a really hard place to to have opportunity for that um, on, on the on the public land side. But now. If Kentucky does have a sleeper area, I would I would say it's kind of in the far southeastern corner of the state. And, you know, a lot of the folks, you know, we've got a pretty big reintroduced elk herd over there. And um, that, that's coal mining country. And, and the way the, the mining has traditionally, there's some underground mining, but the way, the, the way the, a lot of the mining has been done over there has been surface mining. And they will they'll actually do what they call mountaintop removal mining. And it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit controversial, but from a hunting standpoint, basically, you know, if you envision that they, they remove kind of the, kind of the peak of the mountain and it's, you know, you've got a, a steep mountain that's left flat on top. Once the mining is done, they actually reclaim that top area with, you know, native grasses and things like that. And so you've got this really steep peak with this nice flat meadow and almost this food plot atmosphere up on top. The, the elk have really thrived there. That's where a lot of the elk hunting takes place. And a lot of this mining country um, is technically privately owned, but it's owned a lot of times by the, by the, the, the mining companies. And a lot of them allow public access. And so I've heard from a lot of folks um, who've gone over there actually with an elk tag and been really surprised at all the whitetails that they saw, and including some pretty big ones. And it's, and it's kind of a unique opportunity in the East and that it's, it's almost a, a prairie environment, you know, up on top of those mountains. And so if I were looking to, you know, to do like a DIY public hunt in Kentucky, I would definitely think about that eastern area because I think there's there's probably um, that's, that's kind of like the, the last sleeper spot there uh, in the state. But I was actually going to talk about um, some other states in the southeast and not not necessarily one state, but but really kind of a region, and that's that southern Mississippi Delta region. You know, you get into West Tennessee, um, you know, Northwest Mississippi, uh, Eastern Arkansas, Eastern Louisiana. It's a really fertile area. Um, you've you've got there's a there's a ton of agriculture all the way through that that Mississippi drainage, and there's actually a lot of public land opportunity. Now a lot of it. Uh, is in a flood zone, and a lot of it is managed for waterfowl. But if you start looking um, on the on the fish and wildlife websites for these for these various states, you'll find that even some of these national wildlife refuges are open to deer hunting. They may have kind of uh, you know finite times that might not always match the statewide seasons, but they are typically open, especially to, to bow hunting, like in October, early November before the duck seasons get going, and a lot of times before. They actually artificially flood a lot of the areas. And, you know, years ago, Michelle and I lived out in Memphis and I used to hunt some of the WMAs and National Wildlife Refuges kind of up and down West Tennessee from, say, Real Foot Lake down to, you know, down to Shelby County, which is where Memphis is. There's some fantastic public land deer hunting down through there. And um, it, it's an area where, 
you know, the deer densities are pretty high, particularly, you know, um, when the, when the conditions are stable, the water's not too high. Now you get a flood, obviously it's going to move them out pretty quick, but, but like kind of, you, you know, your early season hunting through October, um, you're going to get a lot of deer in those areas. There's still a lot of greenery in those areas. There's, there's typically a lot of different oak species down in there. And you can just expect to see a lot of animals. I always had some, some pretty good luck, you know, hunting down in there. And, um, and then too, like the other thing about like Louisiana, Mississippi and Arkansas, like if you look at the, you know, the, the trends in the, in the whitetail harvest records and the age structure, like, you know, by the National Deer Association over the past few years, like Louisiana and Mississippi and Arkansas, like they, they're kind of leading the nation now in, uh, you know, in the age structure and in, in the highest percentage of three and a half year old plus bucks in the, you know, in the annual take. Now, I think most of the time on average, like a, a three and a half year old deer in Arkansas is probably not going to be as big, you know, either in antler or body size as a, as a three and a half year old deer in Iowa. They're, you know, they're, they're kind of a different subspecies really. But, um, but even so, like there is a lot of opportunity to hunt mature deer down there. There's a, there's a fair amount of public land and, um, you know, and like it, it, it is pretty overlooked. Like most folks taking a DIY whitetail hunt probably aren't going to the Southern Mississippi Delta, but there's, there's definitely, uh, definitely some opportunity down there and, and some pretty good stuff. Well, I mean, you know, I'm guilty as charged, right? You talk about that. Most people are never going to go there. I, I've never been there. I've never hunted. Um, I've hunted Tennessee. I've never hunted uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. I mean, all that, whitetail country and I've never seen any of it. The other thing, Will, that I'd like you to touch on, because I'm sure it changes depending on where you are in those states, but talk about timing in terms of rut and opportunity, because I know in some of those places down there, there's regions where the rut, you know, goes all the way into January. And so that's also another opportunity where, you know, I always say, you know, it's a shame that there's only one November, you know, because those first couple of weeks of November, don't you wish you could be in like four or five states at the same time and they go by so quick. So to have places like that where you can say, hey, I can still do, you know, my rut hunt in Ohio or Illinois or Missouri, and then I can go down here, you know, a month later and have another action packed deer hunt. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, even in, in far southwestern Kentucky, where I am, um, you know, the, the whole month of November is good. But like our, our best week really is is like Thanksgiving. week, And then I, I do a lot of hunting um, in uh, in western Tennessee and, and really up through about the 15th of December. Um, you can expect deer to be doing pretty ruddy things. And, you know, I mean, call it a secondary rut or whatever you want to call it. But like really all over, you know, particularly in, in areas of the deep South and, and some of those areas I mentioned around the Mississippi Delta. I mean, there've been, a, there's a lot of, um, and I, I even wrote a story for you years ago about, you know, chasing the Southern rut. And there are a lot of different, a lot of these States, you can look at their, um, you know, their fawn drop dates, you know, and the biologists will backdate fawns and, and, and figure out the peak, you know, conception periods. And, and, and it can be kind of all over the map, but I mean, in general, you know, when you're speaking of the deep South, you're you're kind of thinking later. Um, you're thinking into November, really all the way through the month of December in some of these places. And and even like you get into, you know, the Alabama Black Belt and some places in Mississippi, you may have a rut that goes through late January to the first of February. But I mean, in general, if you're there from Thanksgiving through Christmas um in that part of the world, deer are probably gonna be doing their thing. And it's and it's kind of right after all the good Midwestern stuff has has ended. But um but yeah, I mean, day in and out, like if I were going to pick a time to hunt in Western Tennessee, um, first week of December would be top of my list. And, uh, and that, and that was kind of the, kind of the way it was, you know, all the way down through, all the way down through, through Memphis. And I, I would say a lot of your guys in, uh, in Arkansas and, you know, especially Southern Arkansas, Louisiana would even go say mid December through new year, you know, that, yeah. that seemed to be pretty hot time in that part of the world a lot of those guys you know of course that's a that's waterfowl country and um a lot of those guys are uh you know they're all about duck hunting in the morning and, and deer hunting in the evenings and, and i'll tell you what um you know 
three and a half year old deer aside, like there's been some big deer coming out of Arkansas and Louisiana in the last few years. So, you know, some of those folks aren't, you know, just, just having covered a lot of big deer for a lot of different magazines and websites and things like it, it seems like the, the culture down there is a little more secretive, you know, I mean, like it wasn't, but about a decade ago, like it was, uh, a, a good buck was one with a, you know, with an antler just big enough to drag him out of the woods with. And, you know, and there were a lot of a big culture of, of hunting with dogs and things like that. I mean, like I remember when I started hunting Tennessee, the buck limit was like 11 a year and then they dropped it down to four or five. And now it's down to, now it's down to two, I think. And you're seeing that, that shift in the deer hunting culture a lot in that region. And it's almost, it's almost overwhelmingly, um, at the request of the hunters, you know, they, they're wanting, you know, better quality bucks to hunt basically. And, uh, and you're seeing that it's, it's happening pretty quickly throughout that region. And, uh, and I, and I think kind of as a byproduct of that, like when a really big deer gets killed, like some of those guys aren't in a big hurry to, you know, to put the thing on a magazine cover, you know, they kind of want to kind of want to keep their little lease quiet. So. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, Arkansas or, or Tennessee or Louisiana might be the next Kentucky. And I want to kick it back to Jace, but before I do, Will, because we touched on late rut and you mentioned that story that you had written for me about chasing the Southern rut. I also want to touch on another state, which I actually do consider a sleeper state when it comes to Southern hunting. And it has the earliest rut and that is Florida. Nobody thinks about going to Florida for a deer hunt, but there are actually some really nice whitetails down there. And it just has a ton to offer to a non-resident deer hunter from great weather to the opportunity to like bring your family and do a bunch of other fun stuff while you're down there. And it's pretty accessible in terms of tags, public land and all that stuff. And you can start as early as the middle of August for rutting bucks in the sunshine state. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, um, I've hunted Florida a lot. I've done a lot of turkey hunting down there. I've done a lot of pig hunting down there. I've actually never deer hunted, but I remember years ago, whenever um, my dad and I would make a road trip down there every spring, usually in March, and uh, we'd go down there and we'd, we'd pig for a few days above and around everywhere and thinking like, man, my mind is playing tricks on me. There's no way there are fawns on the ground in in March. And um but you know, come to find out, like they've got a uh, they've got a late summer breeding season down there, you know, and it's and it's all um if you ask the locals down there anyway, and I think talking to some of the biologists too, like a lot of that is uh is timed around the water table, you know, and when, you know, like the Everglades have water on them and when it's safest to put the fawns on the ground. And uh, you know, it happens to be that like early spring is kind of the dry season down there in, in South Florida. And so that's that's when you see that fawn drop. So yeah, there there are places in in far southern Florida um, where I, I I know the season's open by mid August. It, it may actually open like, and and Jace may know this. It, it may open like the very end of July even. And uh, you know, not only you get a chance to, you know, to hunt some some cool little Florida deer, but you're you're probably going to get a chance at a wild pig at some point too. So, absolutely. And that, so now you know. So we're we're talking about hunting Florida in early to mid August and getting rutting action there. Obviously, we, we know when the traditional rut is across most of the whitetail range. So, you know, from that Halloween week through the, the middle of October down toward, or middle of November rather, to later in November into early December down in, in Will's neck of the woods there. And now, Jace, I'd like you to talk a little bit about a late sort of opportunity and because we, we we certainly can't do this episode without touching on it. And that's Arizona coos deer, which is going to take you into like the latter part of January, even into February to hunt rutting bucks. And, and similar to Florida, not only is it very unique in terms of the timing, but you've got another unique sort of habitat, subspecies, terrain, all kinds of things that make it a very unique hunt. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just real quick, touching on what Will was saying for Florida. Um, I'm not, it might be July, um, but I have been down there in August and <clears throat> there's nothing cooler than chasing rutting deer in 
95 degree heat and 96% humidity. It was, uh, it was very, very interesting to see that. Um, but, uh, did you, uh yeah. is it, hang on, hang on. Is it true by the way that you did that entire hunt in a loincloth? Well, that yeah, is true. I got the photos to prove it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So we're yeah, going to have good. those that check out the Peterson's bow hunting social feeds here. After this episode, we're going to have that loincloth retrospective from Jace. So I'm sorry. It was good. No. Yeah. Um, so, but going to the coos deer thing, uh, yeah, I mean, very, you know, you're talking, you're talking January and, uh, you know, late December, January, and you're talking about a really unique species of deer and a really unique state to get to go hunt those deer. You know, Arizona is so draw heavy. Um, it, you know, a lot of times it does get overlooked. And while a lot of your rifle stuff, even for coos deer is draw, um, your bow stuff, you know, you can grab that tag and go down there. And, you know, that is a state that is just absolutely loaded with public land. And, um, you're hunting a species of deer where a hundred inch deer is pretty remarkable. And you, you're hunting a species of deer that is very, very, very hard to kill um, just because they're so elusive, but they do respond super, super well to calling. Um, and again, if you're a, if you're a spot and stock guy, um, if you're a Western hunter and you want to try your hand at spotting and stalking uh, whitetails, that's just a great opportunity because that's what you're doing. I mean, um, unless you're set up in a stand somewhere along some sort, unless you've got some sort of pattern figured out and you, you've seen something and you get a standard blind set or, or you're hunting water. You know, that's, that's definitely always an option. You know, when you're, when you're hunting water, Arizona has lots of guzzlers, lots of little different things where water sources, where these bucks will come into. But, uh, a lot of guys, um, when they get down there, they want that Western experience. They want to be up on, uh, a ridge or a plateau or something like that and putting their glass to work, finding a buck, either putting that buck in his bed or anticipating where he's traveling to and trying to get in on him. And you talking out about an animal whose reaction time is, Oh my gosh. I mean, they can turn inside out in seconds and you know, they're, they are a small deer and their vitals are really, really small. So it, it's, it's, it's super, super challenging. You know, I, I tell people all the time, if you can spot and stalk an antelope, um, with your bow, you can go out and spot and stalk an antelope with your bow and you can, you can, you know, run, run an arrow through that, uh, without taking a poke that is just absolutely ridiculous distance wise. Um, you can kill, you can kill anything with your bow. You can spot and stalk anything. And I, I would say the same with, with those, with those coos deer, because they are just, uh, they're a remarkable little, little, little subspecies of deer. And, and, and I, I don't know, man. Um, it just, when you think about it, when you add that, when you add that deer into the mix and you go back to like what Will was saying in, you know, you got that December time frame and the Midwest and you've got the October, you know, through basically, you know, November time frame. And then you factor in Florida and some of these other states. I mean, you're looking at if you're a whitetail nut, you can put together a, a, a schedule that takes you from, you know, from August to you know, through a a good part of January. And I know some states even go like into February and things like that, but it's, it's pretty remarkable, the opportunities that are out there. And that Arizona one is a good one. I think we need to like round up a bunch of sponsors and the three of us <laughs> could go on the road for six months straight with starting mm -hmm. August one in Florida, ending January 31 in Arizona and six months straight. It's a live semi-live hunt, live updates every day from the field. We'd have millions of people tuned in for yeah. six can't months, you, man. It'd be great. Can't you guys cover that for us, Christian? I'm Don't working on it, buddy. Just a little bit of money and, and, and do that. Keep, and then you get to ask your wife first and explain it to her. And then let your, Will and I know how that it. goes. And then we'll keep, go next. Keep your schedules clear starting <laughs> August 1. That's all I'm saying. Um, you know, it's funny, you were talking about the coos deer, Eddie Claypool, as you know, is just loves mm -hmm. that the coos deer hunting and he refuses to miss that trip. That's like his favorite of the year. And I always joke, you talked about how small they are. I'm like, they all, every deer he kills out there looks like a Pennsylvania buck. And I'm like, there is no way I'm going all the way to Arizona to shoot a deer that looks like just what I got down the road right here. And he, he swears, you know, you don't understand because you've got to experience the, you know, the habitat and obviously they're they are different, you know, in, in terms of how right. they respond and all that. But um, it, it is, like you said, to most people, you show most people like in Pennsylvania or Delaware or West Virginia, 
you know, a picture of one of those coos deer, you're going to be like, man, what's so special about that? You know? Yeah. And, and it is the entire process. You know, it is the terrain. It is uh, the animal. It's, it's, it's the whole, it's, it's the whole experience. And, and, you know, there's, there's just a lot of different ways to get after those deer um, from, from, you know, water holing it to, you know, getting in a stand, getting in a blind spot and stock, all that. It, it gives you a lot of different options. Well, let's, uh, you know, we could talk about more and more states for hours, but let's transition and say the last portion of this podcast into talking about some considerations in terms of gear, travel, logistics, and that sort of thing. And I'll just start it out with equipment, specifically in terms of bow setup. One of the things that I think is nice about traveling for a whitetail hunt versus maybe some other species, because you have to figure, you know, nationwide on average, right? 80% of all of our bow hunters are whitetail hunters. And then the other 20% are people who might specialize, you know, in elk, mule deer, antelope, some of those other things. And if you're chasing some of those other things, whether it's, you know, say antelope, or you might be anticipating a, a little bit further of a shot, you might want to change some of your gear in terms of going to a lighter arrow or something like that. If you're going on an elk hunt or a moose hunt, you might be thinking about penetration and kinetic energy and wanting to, you know, go to a, a different broadhead or a heavier arrow. But if you're just traveling for a whitetail hunt, for most of us, that's going to be whatever bow we already have set up to hunt right here close to home is going to be exactly the bow that you can throw in the back of the truck and be in good shape to go hunt whitetails pretty well anywhere. Would you guys agree with that? And even if you agree generally, maybe you have some other, you know, just considerations in terms of your overall bow setup. Yeah. Um, I get excited about this part. This is the part where we get to argue about stuff. So, uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, uh, really almost regardless of what I'm hunting. I mean, I, I kind of set my bow up the the same way. I'm not a, a big long distance shooter um, for much anything, but, but particularly so for, for whitetails. And I mean, um, I've kind of, I guess over the years ebbed and flowed with, with different trends and shot, you know, really long axle to axle bows and shot long brace height bows. But I, I think for me, just for a hunting bow in general, like I, any more, um, I like something that's fairly short, uh, you know, less than 32 inches axle to axle. And I mean, most of your bows today, I mean, the risers are built as such that uh, you can get a pretty short bow that's still really easy to shoot. I'm looking for a, you know, for an IBO speed of around, you know, 330 to 340 most of the time. That's usually around a six inch brace height. And uh, for me personally, I, I shoot. 60 pounds across the board. Um, I shoot a pretty heavy arrow, not crazy, but like a 450 to 475 grain finished arrow. And I usually shoot 125 grain fixed broadheads. And um, that that seems to work really well, like I, almost regardless of the critter, but but especially so on on 25 yard whitetails, you know. And uh, I, I guess like the one thing that I would say, you know, for, for Southern whitetails in particular, you do tend to be hunting them up in the timber. They tend to be, um, you know, like, like whitetails anywhere else, like they move right at dark, but because you're up in the timber, like it's, it's a little bit darker than, than normal. And so, um, I like big, bright, um, you know, fiber optic pins. I like a, I like a kind of a traditional boring, you know, fixed five pin sight and, uh, and I like a good size peep. Like I don't like a little bitty peep aperture that's, that's, that I got to squint through right at dark. And so that's for my bow anyway, I, I guess it's, it's kind of, it's kind of boring, but I don't know. It works pretty well. So. Well, you're such an Eastern hunter, you know, how, right? unso how unsophisticated, <laughs> you know, I saw Jay smiling. He's flattening out I'm the like, rim of his hat. You know, I'm like, he's like, yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. like, he's like, so I'm, I'm really, I'm, I've taken notes for the first time. <laughs> he's like, yeah, Jace is like a five pin sight. What do you like them? Them 019 fiber optics that'll cover up your whole target. Well, okay, Jace, you can you can uh, set us all straight now. So, I actually, Will, I actually Will, thought, yeah, it's pretty good advice, I think. Great advice. And and, and it's not going to be – so Will caught me, though, because uh, 
when I coach football, all the boys tell me that they always know something's coming when, you know, it's, that's what I go to. It's like the brim of my hat. And as soon as the brim of the hat starts to flex, it's like, oh my gracious. So we'll, we'll pick that off right away. But no, I actually totally, I actually totally agree with what Will is saying. Um, I don't now this, this is why I didn't start out that way. And I think sometimes you got to throw yourself under the bus to help others be successful. And that's like the point of these things. So like for me as a Western hunter, um, I get an antelope standing out there has no idea in the neighborhood and he's at 70 yards um you can tar and feather me but it's going because i i shoot that distance i practice that distance um i'm running you know i'm running a, a, a movable single pin sight or or a double pin something like that where i am dialing to the exact yard i'm using uh a, a, a different stabilizer system that you don't need for whitetails if you even need to put a stabilizer on your bow there you go i said it so um you know, but, but here's the thing I agree with is I got humbled pretty quickly when I took a 60 yard shot at a whitetail and that was just a mistake. Um, they, 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 they have an uncanny ability to react. And what I have learned is I like an ultra, not, I wouldn't say ultra heavy arrow, but I want my arrow to be heavy because heavy is quiet. Um, I like a heavier arrow that is quieter. And most of those shots are inside for me inside of 40. Um, even when I'm hunting like Western Nebraska or those types of things, um, my shots are still because I'm limiting myself on it because I don't want to force a bad situation and I don't want to deal with a bad situation because I've dealt with them before and nobody likes a rodeo. And so it's just, you know, knowing what that learning curve is and then, and then realizing, Hey, this isn't a 60, 70, 80 yard animal. It's just not. And, and, and I don't think that it should be, um, and so, yeah, most of my, I got really enamored with hunting out of a tree stand. So most of my shots are, are 40 and in, and most of them are 30 and in. So, you know, a standard five pin sight with a six inch stabilizer and, you know, not the real sexy setup where you look at it and you go, oh my gosh, I mean, look at that guy's front bar and back bar and he's got an offset stabilizer and, you know, he's got a yardage tape that dials out to 120 yards and everything is just, you know, I mean, it's just meat and potatoes, right? Keep it simple. Um, and you know, I just lean on the side of making sure that my arrow is heavy. I like a good four fletched arrow. Um, and the only thing that I, you know, that will, will shoots that fixed blade, fixed blade broadhead, whereas I like a, I like a expandable broadhead, um, for, for white tails. And I shoot, and I shouldn't say for white tails, I shoot an expandable broadhead for every, I can't remember the last time I shot a fixed blade broadhead. And we could argue that till the cows come home, but, uh, you know, oh, that no. was the only one where I went, where I went to my hat. <laughs> Gosh, dang I'm, it, Will. But, I'm, I'm uh, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I totally agree with what Will said. I mean, it's, 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 it's great advice. And, you know, when it comes to white tail hunting, both of you guys have spent, more time in a tree than I, than I have, or, or probably, I mean, more time hunting that particular, particular animal. So, you know, I try to take, you know, good advice from that. And that's, I thought Will's advice was perfect. Well, I'm not going to jump into the broadhead debate because I've hunted with Will and we had a couple of rodeos down there. So he, he ain't going to want to hear any advice from me on that. But, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to transition right over to something else you said which is about getting in the tree and of course you don't have to hunt in a tree but from logistics standpoint now if you're traveling to deer hunt okay i think throw on a if you have a pop-up ground blind i think that's great to throw in the vehicle and then i'm going to give my shameless tree saddle plug here this is the the tree saddle portion uh, you know i always like laughed at tree saddles and Two years ago, I, I hunted out of one for the first time, and I, I have actually become not a total saddle hunting geek, but a bit of one. Boy, they are light and convenient. And when you think about traveling to hunt deer, right, you're going to be doing scouting and hunting kind of all at the same time. You're probably going to have to move a few times. You know, I don't know about other people. I do not, even, even a bunch of hang-on stands and sticks, I really don't want to take you know, five hang on stands and five sets of climbing sticks. I'd much rather take my tree saddle and one or two sets of sticks, lightweight, portable. Maybe if you have a good hunt somewhere, leave a set in the tree and have one other set to bop around with. But man, it's hard to beat a tree saddle 
I would think for for a, any kind of a, a traveling DIY hunt. You know, I did one, Jace. First one I did actually was out there in Montana on walk in, yeah. you know, public land. And man, yeah. it was, it worked out perfectly. And I, I've been hunting even on my private, you know, the farms that I hunt around here in Pennsylvania the last couple of years and, and killing multiple deer out of the saddle. It's just so slick once you get used to it. So that'd be my biggest recommendation in terms of a, a climbing system. I would really point people towards a saddle. Obviously, if you're already a saddle hunter, you know the advantages, but you know, a lot of people have just gotten curious about saddles the last couple of years. That continues, right? There's more and more people coming into it all the time. And if you've been thinking about it and you haven't done it yet, maybe if you are planning, you know, a deer hunting trip, that's a good reason, you know, as good as any to go ahead and take the plunge and, and try it out. So with that, maybe a couple of tips on other hunting related gear, aside from just the bow arrow broadheads that you would recommend for folks. Uh, well, one thing I would, I would say is, is, you know, I like being a Western guy. I still, I, I love being in the tree stand, like I said, but I still like to get on the ground too. And I think uh, one of the things that, that I've done that is getting, you know, kind of more popular, I guess, kind of like your tree saddles is using a bow mounted decoy in combination with the 3D buck decoy. And that That's is right. something. I, I forgot that you've been like slaying all kinds of deer with that. Yeah, man, that is, that is now it's, it, it's not what I'm going to call an ultra light type of type of setup. Um, you know, obviously the bow mounted decoy is just, just a cloth decoy that mounts to the mounts to the bow, um, which is ultra light. And there's situations where you can take that decoy and make it a buck decoy with some slap on antlers and, and do that. But, uh, you know, one of the things that really works well, especially when you're ho hunting open open type country and you get those bucks that are cruising and roaming and things like that is taking a really realistic uh 3d buck decoy setting that buck decoy out and then backing yourself up into some cedars backing yourself up into some plump thicket i've used nothing more than a little patch of crp um and getting on the ground and having that bow uh mounted decoy which you know you want a doe on your on your bow in that situation so that it just appears to other bucks traveling like, oh, my gosh, you know, they look over and they see it's very it needs to be a very visible game. And they look over and they see that buck and then they see that dose, you know, in that position there. And they think, hey, he's got something going on over there. He's that is a buck tending. Um, he's, he's staying right by that that doe. And the reaction that you can get to that um, can be pretty phenomenal. And then when you incorporate calling rattling grunting snort wheezing all of those different types of things you get a type of hunt that is kind of outside your typical whitetail norm where you're on the ground and you are part of the decoy setup um and it it, it changes things and it just gives you another tactic it's not going to work all the time but it is a good tactic to use um when wherever you know wherever you're at i would say it's, it's it's possible if you can get some open type ground and if you can get some places where you can um set that decoy up where you know bucks are cruising where they can visibly see it um it can it can change the it can change things for you in a hurry um and it's a great tactic to use if if, if you want to get out of the tree if you want to get on the ground um so yeah that's just that's that's one i would recommend is a, is a 3d buck decoy um, and a bow mounted uh, doe decoy. If you can come to Pennsylvania and kill a deer, deer <sighs> any deer, any buck, any, any, deer? any, any deer, well, any buck, any buck, I want to see you actually decoy the buck in and kill it, then I will be 110% sold. I will genuflect <laughs> before you. I will get you a whitetail trophy, yay big, I want or a, a statue, championship actually. goal. Before, yes. You got it, a statue. Okay. Now, so so good, good advice, Jace. You know, saddle, good advice, decoying, good advice. Will's got the best advice at all, though. I know it because he mentioned it earlier. You just got to have a lot of corn, a lot of bags of corn in your truck. <laughs> well, it, it does help, um, except for the uh, except for the, the ride to the sheriff's office part of it. Most of your uh, most of your public lands, you can't do any baiting, um, even though it is kind of a, a part of the, the hunting culture down south. You usually can't do it on WMAs and certainly not on National Wildlife Refuges. But um, talking about. Uh, you know, like your, your ambush. I, I, I would just say that like, I, I've 
been reading some of your stuff, Jace, about like hunting with some of the bow mounted decoys, and I'm pretty intrigued. And it's kind of getting to be on the list of things I, I really want to try and see because it just looks cool. Um, but uh, talking about you know being up in a tree, um, I'm I'm not a saddle guy. I haven't. Uh, I've, I've I've gotten in one. I, I think I actually might have tried yours out when you were here hunting with me, Christian. And uh, it's uh, I don't know. It's just something I hadn't. Uh, I hadn't used it a lot myself, but you know, down here in this part of the world, um, and and even and especially as you get farther south, and 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 even more so, like in that Delta region that I was talking about, in those river bottom areas and things, most of the timber is really tall and really straight, and just about the perfect diameter for a climbing stand. And um, maybe there, 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 there he goes, old there go. school again. Old yes. School again. You know what? I think I think you forgot to mention the whisker biscuit. You like to put a whisker biscuit on your boat too. You get hey, your, your old man in the back up for sure. That's yep. right. Yep. So mm-hmm. so here's the thing. So like number one, like does a tree saddle work if you don't have anybody to tell that you're hunting in a tree saddle? If you're hunting DIY, I would say that like obviously it's not going to work. But no, uh, the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The the climbing stand, man, like, you know, you can just look at a hunter side by side, somebody in a tree saddle and somebody in an old man climber. And like, you're not going to convince me that the tree saddle is more comfortable. It's just, it's just not, you know, and the, uh, a, a lot of those climbing stands, you know, they, there's some, some really lightweight ones, like Lone Wolf has got some really good lightweight ones. And then like some, it's got an open shot that they've been making for 20 some odd years. And that's, that's the stand that I usually use. And like by the, I actually did the math on this. Like by the time you add in the weight of your sticks and your saddle and your platform and all the stuff that you've got to have with a tree saddle, the climbing stand is actually a little bit lighter and certainly simpler to use. I mean, you put it on the tree and climb the tree, and then it's more comfortable this, too. This, like, is, this is this is this is this is all spoken like a guy who's never saddle hunted. So it, it's just I, turning into you're absolutely guy. you're you're, you're, you're absolutely a guy who doesn't really need to. So um so yeah, because I know the climbing stand works really, really well. And uh so I I mean I guess if I was coming down here to hunt, that would be my recommendation. Like your saddle will probably work just fine. Um, but don't think you have to have one to do this DIY hunt because your old school climbing stand will still work really, really well. And there are trees everywhere, at least in this part of the world to climb. Now, the the exception to that obviously is, um, you know, as you get farther north and, and particularly in the Midwest and things, I mean, uh, you know, your trees get pretty limited on, on what you can climb. And I mean, um, even in a lot of Kentucky, I mean, I, I will lean toward lock on stands and, and sticks just because they're they're more versatile but as you get down south um you know climbing stands are still really popular down there for a reason they, they just work yeah i i mean i actually like climbing stands and and i've killed you know plenty of things out of climbing stands and they are they are comfortable and they're a good option i i just i just want to note that you know you made some sort of blanket statements about saddle setups and it really depends on what your components are. Cause I'm not even like one of the super hardcore guys, but trust me, you'd have plenty of super hardcore guys that'd be like, you know, there is no way that like your climber weighs the same as my saddle setup because they do get really light and, and they use some super like minimalist stuff that I don't even want to use, but it does work. But, but I get your point. Sure. Um, last thing before we wrap it up, um, I kind of wanted to just touch on like the logistics of lodging when it comes to these DIY deer hunts. And one of the things that's pretty nice, as opposed, again, you know, Jace to an elk hunt, uh, even an antelope hunt, because a lot of times there you're out in really rural areas. Most of the time when you're, you're doing a DIY whitetail hunt, you're not that far from town and you don't have to hike five, six, seven miles in, you know, you might have to hunt five, six, 700 yards, you know, in in a lot of cases or less from a parking area. So it's pretty easy logistically to stay 
at a, a nice motel, you know, be able to get a shower every day, sleep in a warm bed. You don't got to get up three hours before sunrise and, you know, you can get some good meals and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's kind of a nice part of a deer hunt. And I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts just in terms of the that end of the logistics of it. But, uh, you know, it's a little bit more civilized maybe than than sleeping, you know, in a, in a bivy sack on the side of a mountain for a week. I've spent enough nights sleeping in a, what I call a coffin, because that's what a bivy sack feels like that, uh, you know, even when I'm mail cutting now, I, I, I go, I'm, I'm, I'm packing my two man tent and I'm giving myself some room, but what I like to do, I mean, the thing is, you know, motel, uh, staying in a motel or thing like that are, are great. I mean, it, it is good. You get some comforts at home. Um, you're in town. Um, you know, there's restaurants, there's things like that. Uh, you get that shower that you're talking about. Um, you know, but I guess what you have to look at is from, from a price point and, and what you're looking to accomplish too, um, you know, depending on what your budget is. Um, now gas is of course going to be a, a major issue, right? Because it's, it's, it's out of sight. Um, but me personally, what I've done, and I don't know that this will be my go-to this year, but I like to pull my camper. Um, and, and I simply like to do that because a lot of places that I go, um, you know, I can pull that camper into some BLM. I can pull it onto some grassland. I can pull it into, I can find a plug-in. I can pay, you know, 10 bucks a night to find a, a plug-in in Nebraska. And I still got my shower. I can still cook. I can still do all those things, but, um, I'm not dropping a lot of money at restaurants and, and things like that. Um, you know, motel rooms you're looking at, you know, usually even at some of your podunk motels, you know, you're looking at 60, 70, maybe 80 bucks a night. Um, so, you know, but, but it's all relative again, it's kind of like what it goes back to what you guys were just talking about with the, with the saddle, um, with the saddle, uh, climber deal. Um, because you know, you, if you put, do the hard math now, it might be, might be better to stay in a motel as opposed to, as opposed to dragging your camper out there too. But, uh, there's other options as well. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, if you're, still, if your uh, your mileage, your fuel mileage goes from, yeah. you know, 22 miles to nine miles a gallon when you're pulling that camper, right. you know? Right. But you can still, I mean, like some of my favorite times were elk hunting, um, early when I first started elk hunting before I bow hunted, you know, I mean, we, we rifle hunted elk. That's how I learned how to, I mean, that was what we did. I, I, I can't I, believe, I can't believe I had you on the show. You admit <laughs> that now? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, we would set up like a big wall tent, you know, and it had the, it had the, the stove in it and all the, that sort of stuff. And that is, that is another option, right? Tent camping is an option. Tent camping doesn't have to be super were uncomfortable, especially like when you're whitetail hunting and you have room, you know, you're pulling your truck right up to it. You're not carrying this crap on your back. You're pulling right up to a spot and you're throwing everything out. So you can take, you know, a five, six, eight, 10 man tent. You can create a palace if you want to. You can oh, set up a cook yeah. tent and all kinds well, of stuff. So and, and that's, the, that's the, just an idea. Well, and the thing is, you know, like Will had mentioned earlier, Eastern Kentucky, and it wasn't a whitetail hunt, but years ago when I drew a Kentucky cow elk tag, I camped a lot of the WMAs in Kentucky will allow you to camp for free. And it's not really all that remote. Like I was camped at a WMA that was probably like less than 30 minutes from hazard. So you were still close enough to town. You, I mean, you could take a break in the middle of the day and, and go to Walmart if you needed to. So yeah, you, I mean, you can still camp and, and not be completely remote on most of these whitetail type hunts and we actually saw quite a few you know nice deer on that um that elk hunt too so you're right there there's a lot of deer in that part of the world so i'll let you wrap us up uh will with any last minute tips that you have and uh i'm sure you you know we saved the best nugget of wisdom here for the very end <laughs> you know one thing i will say on a lot of your diy whitetail hunts at least here um the kind of the the whitetail hunting culture in general is like man you've got to you got to drag your deer out it's uh it's it's best to kill him in a spot where you can get to him with a four wheeler or whatever um and people talk about a long drag and how much it sucks and on and on and on um but a, on a lot of wmas and national wildlife refuges and stuff like they, they're closed to anything except foot traffic maybe bicycle traffic and so that's something that i you know that i've, I've picked up um hunting out in in uh you know in jace's country at, out west a lot is like 
if you're going to be a DIY guy, really, regardless of what you're hunting, but I mean, it applies just as much to whitetails as it does to, to mule deer or elk, like invest in a good pack frame. And it's so many times, uh, it is, it is way easier and way faster to, to carry a tarp with you out there and have all your kit there in your pack frame. You kill a deer, you can carry your climbing stand out or your saddle or whatever you're hunting with and go back with your frame and quarter your deer out there in the field and learn how to put it on a pack frame. And you can pack one out in Mississippi, just the same as you can in Colorado and probably save yourself a ton of time because you've got to, you've got to clean him anyway. And if you want to take him to a processor, you can still take quarters into a processor just the same. And so, and the, and then a, another benefit of that too, is like, a lot of these Southern states are, you know, even if it's not the County that you're hunting in they're they're CWD positive. And so for you to get your deer back home, you legally have to quarter it out or, or maybe even take it off the bone anyway. And so that's, that's a step that you're going to have to take. And so I would just encourage folks, even if they're Eastern hunters who really aren't used to that as part of their process, like learn how to take a deer apart in the field and learn how to put it on a pack frame um, have a buddy from Colorado show you how to do it if, if needed. And, uh, and, and it's something that will be a huge asset to you if you start hunting these places, particularly, you know, you hike in a, a mile deep in a river bottom and shoot three does. Like it's, it's handy to be able to carry them out of there because you, you can't legally drive a four-wheeler back there to get them. So yeah, there's, that's, your, that's there's your nugget of wisdom. That is, that actually is great advice. And it brings great up advice. the CWD thing is an issue too, because it's become a real it's become a real issue for me and anybody that travels. It's not just the meat. The meat's not that big of a deal because honestly, you can hang a deer and bone out an entire whitetail in less than a couple hours and get that meat in a cooler. But if you want to do a European mount, it's a real issue because you can't take that brain. You just can't cut the base of the head and take that deer head back home in all likelihood if it's a CWD area. So you have to identify, usually I gotta find a local taxidermist wherever I'm hunting and leave that head there. And if you wanna do a shoulder mount, it's actually a little easier because then you can go to a local taxidermist and he can cape that skull out for you and cut the skull plate off and you can clean the skull plate and bring just the antlers home. But either way, um, you know, to just dovetail with what Will said about dealing with the deer in the field, have that in mind of what you're going to do if you are fortunate enough to succeed. Chances are it's not like the old days where you just throw the deer in the back of the truck and head straight for home. Um, I'm sure there's still a lot of guys that do it, but it's it's against the rules now. So. Uh, we don't need to be spreading CWD to any more areas than it already exists. So, gentlemen, I thought it was an excellent show. There's certainly a lot of opportunity out there for DIY whitetail hunting around this country. And honestly, we just barely scratched the surface of what's there. And uh, hopefully it inspired some people to maybe get an adventure on the books. And I thank you both for your time. I wish you both the best of luck. And um, I don't know what else there is to say. Thanks, Christian. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It was a good time. Thanks for downloading the Peterson's Bow Hunting Podcast. All bow hunting, all the time. Pick up the latest issue of Peterson's Bow Hunting Magazine on your local newsstand or connect with us online at bowhuntingmag.com. <laughs>